Good afternoon. It is 2.01 on February 22nd. And today we are going to be talking about modern Japan and modern China. So that's going to be China from 14, 1500 up to about early 17 or early 1800s. Same thing with Japan. We're going to talk about the warring states in Japan all the way up until um, right before the opening of Japan. So let's get started here. And start with Japan. Now, the first period of Japanese history I want to talk about is called the Warring States Era. And 1467 to 1650 is how long this Warring States period went. It's an entire period of on again, off again civil war. It's a lot of anarchy. There are a lot of warlords who are fighting each other. And at this time, the country, it's officially run by an emperor, but the emperor loses more and more power. And it's eventually replaced by a warlord known as a shogun. Now, the way the Japanese system worked is the shogun was the top warlord and below the shogun were other lords known as daimyo. Uh, these are feudal lords. They own the land, the peasants work the land, and then controlled by the daimyo are samurai. And these samurai, they're elite soldiers who served as the backbone of the Japanese military. The main part of the Warring States era, the important part, begins as the power of the Ashikaga shogunate begins to collapse. Uh, the Ashikaga shoguns never gained control over all of the daimyo, so some were considered free and some fought the government for control of the country. Uh, there was also an increased closeness and increased trade with China. And this led to a desire for greater local autonomy. The Warring States it does not end until the rise of Oda Nobunaga and Toyotomi Hideyoshi, and then eventually Tokugawa Ieyasu. They were all joined together in the movement to end the Warring States period. So let's talk about Oda Nobunaga. Uh, he is in power from 1578 until 1582. Uh, he is the head of the powerful Oda clan, which was the most powerful clan, or in the top three at the very least. And he was clearly the most powerful daimyo by the time we get to the late 1500s. And he is considered in Japanese history as the first great unifier. In 1573, Nobunaga challenged the shogun Ashikaga Yoshiaki, <clears throat> and Nobunaga's army is able to beat the army of Ashikaga Yoshiaki in battle. And this drove Yoshiaki from the capital, which at that time was Kyoto. Now that officially ends the Ashikaga shogunate, and Nobunaga was given the power of the government by the emperor. Now, after gaining the support of the emperor, uh, Nobunaga continued to challenge other daimyo and other clans for control of Japan. During this fighting, Nobunaga is forced to commit ritualistic suicide, better known as seppuku, where he is surrounded by enemy forces inside a temple while he's praying. Now, if you're un familiar with what seppuku is uh, you take your sword and you cut yourself basically in a jigsaw pattern from one end of your stomach to the other and your insides become your outsides and it was considered more respectful and loyal if you went out that way than being killed by your enemy. After that, we have Toyotomi Hideyoshi, 
and he takes over after Nobunaga. Now, Hideyoshi is originally a peasant, but he becomes the second in command to Nobunaga. And after the death of Oda Nobunaga, he continues to unite Japan. Now, Toyotomi Hideyoshi, one of the things he does when he comes to power is he initiates what becomes known as the Great Sword Hunt. During the Great Sword Hunt, samurai are required to prove that they are from noble descent. And if a samurai couldn't prove that they had the nobility and the wealth to be a samurai, they were forcibly disarmed and they were sent back into the peasantry that they came from. By the time the Great Sword Hunt is done, somewhere around 95% of all samurai are disarmed and forced to become peasants again. Now, following the Great Sword Hunt, uh, Hideyoshi is going to try and attempt to freeze social classes. Uh, he prohibited samurai from quitting the services of their daimyo, and in many ways the samurai quit being a military class and they become a, a part of the bureaucracy. They just become government agents. Hideyoshi, he tries to invade Korea in the year 1592. Uh, he does not gain victory and his failure to achieve victory really damages his reputation. After the death of Hideyoshi in 1592, he left a young son whose name was Hideyori. Uh, Hideyoshi planned for his son Hideyori to become the next shogun, but because Hideyori is so young, he has to have a regent. A regent is somebody older, usually a close advisor, who runs the country until the next ruler comes of age. So there's a regency that's formed between two people. These two people were Hideyoshi's closest confidants and closest um, advisors. One was named Tokugawa Iesu, and the other one was Ishida Mitsunari. Both Tokugawa Iesu and Ishida Mitsunari are going to be advisors to this child shogun Hideyori. Well, Tokugawa Iesu begins to seize power from both Ishida and Hideyori, and eventually this power grab becomes well known. And Iesu is going to be challenged by other daimyo because he is openly and brazenly trying to seize power. On October 21st, the year 1600, one of the most famous battles in Japanese history, and really one of the most famous battles in history in general happens, and this was the Battle of Sekigahara. Uh, the Battle of Sekigahara pitted the armies of the Tokugawa clan against the armies of the Ishida clan. Now this battle it happened south and west of Osaka, on the plains near Sekigahara. It happens after a heavy downpour. The field is muddy. The rain has just made everything a disaster. And Iesu secretly made a deal with some of the plans of the Mitsunari clan. And Iesu offered these allies of the Mitsunari clan land in exchange for switching sides. Originally, the Tokugawa clan is outnumbered. It looks like the Mitsunari clan will win. But during battle, a few of those allies actually do change sides, which swings the balance of power in favor of the Tokugawa clan, and Tokugawa Iesu is going to end up winning. So that brings us to the Tokugawa era, which goes from 1603 all the way until 1616. First of all, Tokugawa Iesu becomes the new shogun, and he begins to reorganize Japan according to a system that works best for him. First thing he does is he moves the capital from Osaka to Edo. Edo is now known as Tokyo, by the way. So it's the same city as today, Tokyo, only then it was known as Edo. 
Um, after he moves the capital from Osaka to Edo, uh, Tokugawa Iesu is going to confiscate the land of his defeated enemies. He's going to force people to move, and he's going to put the daimyo who are closest to him and that are his strongest allies, the nearest to his personal land as possible. And then if you are one of his enemies, you are put on the far outskirt reaches of Japan because then you'd have to fight through everybody to get to him. Iesu is going to continue the sword hunt. He's going to further limit who can serve as a samurai. And he's going to make a rule that says daimyo are only allowed to marry and they're only allowed to repair their personal castles with permission of Iesu. Not only that, but the wives and the children of these daimyo had to live in Edo inside of Iesu's castle. Even further than that, the individual daimyo were required to live in Edo every other year, and if they wanted to see their family, they had to come to Edo. <clears throat> Tokugawa Iesu, he passes new laws, and these new laws are meant to control the court system, control the temples, control the shrines, and even control the daimyo. And many of these laws are going to be based on the ideas of loyalty and honor. Now for this week, your reading that you have to deal with is about the seclusion of Japan. In 1630, the shogunate is going to close the borders of Japan. There's going to be a national policy where Japanese are forbidden from leaving the Chinese and the Dutch are the only outsiders who are going to be allowed in. And the Chinese and the Dutch, they're not actually allowed to set foot in Japan. They're limited to an island in the harbor of Nagasaki, which was the city furthest away from where the Shogun lived. Now, this national policy of seclusion is going to be adopted in 1630, and it will be strictly enforced until 1854. Now, what happens with the Tokugawa economy? Uh, Japan is going to experience a long period of peace and seclusion. Uh, problems do eventually develop, though, because there's only so much land in Japan new ideas that come in are limited and people can't leave either so by the year 1700 uh, the economy is approaching its limits due to population increases uh, there's only so much growth that the japanese economy had by the time we get to the 1700s contraception and infanticide or practice to try and control the population increases. So there was active prevention of pregnancy and then there was systematic killing of infants. There was a strong internal market that kept commerce flowing throughout Japan, but industrialization was extremely limited because of the capabilities of Japanese culture and Japanese advancements. Eventually, the Japanese economy is going to slow almost to a halt, and things remain mostly the same all the way up until the 1850s and 1860s. 1850 Japan looks almost the same as the year 1600. Time stands still in Japan for almost 250 years. The other country we have to talk about is China. And when you talk about China, you usually do it through the terms of dynasties. And there's only two dynasties that we need to talk about. There's the Ming Dynasty and the Qing or Qing 
dynasty. The Ming are going to rule from the year 1368 all the way until 1644. The Ming are going to take over after China is conquered by the Mongolians or the Mongols. And once the Ming come to power, the Mongol influence is going to be slowly eradicated through various government policies. Uh, a Ming vassal state known as Manchuria is going to eventually overthrow the Ming dynasty and become known as the Qing. And the Qing emperors are going to conquer Taiwan and expand Chinese influence into Central Asia. And it's under the Qing that China grows to the size and mass it is today. Now I'm going to talk about both of them at the same time primarily for time purposes, but also because there are a lot of similarities between the two groups of emperors. So with commerce, the early Ming emperors believed in isolationism. They wanted to keep out foreign power and foreign influence and they ran primarily an agrarian economy. But by the middle of the 1600s, trade starts to grow due to a rise in population. The government relaxes their isolationist policy and people from Europe start to come back into China. Now this relaxation in government policy, it started a commercial revolution and it led China to become the most commercialized non-industrial society in the world. So they didn't really have an industrial revolution until fairly recently in history time, but they had a very full and very expansive commercial revolution. There were private Shanxi banks and the Shanxi banks opened throughout China. Uh, these were banks that were privately owned by wealthy merchant families. Uh, these families would personally facilitate trade. They would personally extend credit to others. And these Shanxi banks uh, get so big and powerful that they spread to Singapore, they spread to Japan, and there are even branches in Russia. Uh, this is a Shanxi note, like a bank note. And then the picture at the bottom is a surviving front, a surviving Shangxi bank building. Now what about urban growth? Most urban growth happens in these intermediate secondary market towns. Uh, so there are these towns that are going to facilitate trade between the large cities and the small little villages. In these intermediate towns and even in the smaller towns, the family structure is very much based on Confucian ideals and Confucian traditions. Uh, women were expected to obey the men, everybody served the state, and the man of the house was the most important. And then also everybody looked up to their elders and their ancestors. Women were physically restricted the practice known as foot binding was common. If you have never looked up foot binding before, pause this lecture for about a minute, Google the words foot binding, and then let it sink in. And if you do actually do that, send me an email. I'd like to hear what you think of the idea of foot binding. I wanna hear what you have to say about it. Now both the Ming and the uh, Xing dynasties they have very strong governments and they have very strong competent emperors. And the emperors allowed their administrations to run the government while uh, he focused on cultural and religious things. Uh, the emperor put the best government into place possible 
and then let the government run itself while he concentrated on keeping the spirit of China alive and the religion of China solid. Education is based on the teachings of Confucius. Uh, education spread throughout China and it became increasingly important as the government bureaucracy got bigger and bigger and bigger. And that's because the Chinese government institutes a civil service exam that had to be taken so that you could potentially earn a position in the government. Candidates for the civil service exam would be screened at a local office. And if they looked promising, they would take a county exam. If the candidate passed the county exam, they would become a member of what was known as the gentry, basically a middle class person. And then they became eligible to take the provincial exam. Now the provincial exam was given only once every three years. And if the candidate passed the provincial exam, then they have, they have to take what's known as the metropolitan exam. The metropolitan exam is also given only once every three years. Um, every time the metropolitan exam was given, generally less than 90 people were able to pass the test. Now, Europeans are first coming to China in large numbers in the 1500s. Many of the Europeans that come to China are missionaries, and a lot of the missionaries are members of the Jesuit group. Now, if you remember from a couple weeks ago, when I was talking about the Catholic Counter-Reformation, I mentioned that the Jesuits are basically the Pope's stormtroopers, and China is one of the places that the Jesuits are going to stormtroop into to uh, convert people. One European Jesuit named Matteo Ricci is going to master the Chinese language and will share knowledge of Western math and science with Chinese scholars. And then Jesuits are going to compare the philosophies of Jesus and Confucius together and say one and the other are both compatible with each other. And then church services will be held in the native Chinese languages. Eventually, missionaries will complain to the Pope about these Chinese language services, and the missionaries will complain that the Japanese are allowed to continue their ancestor worship. And as a result of these complaints, the Emperor Kangxi is going to order an end to the preaching of Christianity in China, and these foreign missionaries will be expelled. There are some Europeans that come primarily to trade and make money despite the gradual restrictions placed on them. Much like in Japan, China does try to regulate trade and these trading restrictions were known as the Canton system. And that's because the only place that Europeans could conduct their trade was outside of the walled city of Canton. So all trade done by Europeans has to occur outside the city walls of Canton. Any other trading done between Europeans and Chinese anywhere in the country was considered to be illegal. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, Europeans, specifically the British East India Trading Company, they will trade tea and silk for gold and silver. And the reason that the British East India Trading Company and other Europeans have to give the European or give the Chinese gold and silver is because the Chinese refused to accept goods from Europe because the Chinese thought that their materials were better than anything that they could get from Europe. All right, so that's going to be it for this week. Your work for this week is to complete a chapter quiz, and you have a discussion with four questions, 
And all four questions are based on the reading for this week about the seclusion of Japan. Our midterm will be the week of March the 8th. And I will have your midterm open for one full week. It will go from Tuesday, the 8th of March, and it will close Monday, the 14th of March. It will be a proctored midterm, and there are a couple of different ways you can do this. You can sign up for an in-person proctoring session at one of the West Georgia Tech libraries, or you can take the midterm at home or wherever you have computer access by using the lockdown browser. Now, if you've had a class online at West Georgia Tech before, you are probably familiar with the lockdown browser and the challenges that it may have. But if you have never used the lockdown browser, maybe this is your first semester or your first online class, let me tell you now, the lockdown browser has some bugs and it takes a little bit of getting used to. And I'm saying that now because I want you to plan early and not try to do your midterm exam at the last minute. Know that there are some issues with the lockdown browser and I, am, I will be available to answer emails, of course, over that weekend but the answers may not come as quick as you need. So if possible, try and get your midterm done Tuesday the 8th, Wednesday the 9th, Thursday the 10th, or even um, Friday the 11th. But I will get you out some more information on the midterm exam next week. I just wanted you to start thinking about how and where and even when you're going to take your midterm exam. But once again, that will be open from March 8th all the way until March 14th. You can take it at home using your computer and a webcam, or you can take it in person at any West Georgia Technical College library where uh, you want to come in and visit. All right, any questions, concerns, comments, please always send me an email. And once again, if you do take the time to look up foot binding, let me know what you think. I'm really, truly curious and interested. Until next time, have a good week. We'll see you soon. Bye.